thumbs up. Right. Good Where do I need to stand for the TV? <laughs> Am I right here? Here. Yep. There's an X marks the spot there if you ah. really must. But you'd have to tweet the PC round. Yeah. Right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm John Reno. I'm G4SWX, the RSGB's VHF manager. A couple of um, housekeeping things first. If the fire alarm goes off, please leave orderly by the door, file down the stairs, and assemble out in the car park. Um, there's no recording of the lectures, either by video or audio, except the official ones, I'm afraid. And please switch off your mobile phones or switch them to silent so uh, we don't have any um, unnecessary QRM spreading up onto the six-meter band. <laughs> um, it actually is really good to have uh, Chris G4IFX coming to a talk today because... He's talking about a subject that's sort of fairly close to my own DXing interests. I'm not such a six-meter lunatic. I'm more of a bit two-meter lunatic. But polarization of inbound signals is something that's always fascinated me. And I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to do something and certainly learn a lot about six-meter uh, signals this morning. So without further ado, Chris G4IFX. Morning, all. So... Just to introduce myself a little bit more, I was the editor of the Six News, I was the secretary of Six News, now I'm the chairman, it's sort of Buggins' turn, you know, you sort of move around from one to the other. I want to talk to you about a subject that I think is really interesting too, and it's a way in which we are mostly blind to the true nature of the signals that we're, that we're receiving. Um, at HF, people don't really care about polarisation. It's all scrambled up anyway, so what the hell. If you're working at two metres and above, unless you're playing AME or satellites, it, you know, the signal you transmit more or less ends up at the other end, the same polarisation as it started-ish. But on six metres, via or the ionosphere, definitely, it's not, that, is not, that is not the case. But it's not as chaotic as you might, as you might think either. So I just wanted to find out. I, I'm not pretending that I'm doing some new, dramatically new research. It's not even novel because I copied it from Graham G3TCT to sit in there. Not, well, not the technique, but the, the idea. But I just wanted to find out. So it, it's, it's research for me, if nothing else. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a bit about polarizer, and I'm sure you all know this, so I won't bore you at great length. It's got some nice little graphics, though, that I found. Um, what the ionosphere does to the polarization of your signals what I did, there's some sort of practical stuff around the equipment that I'm using, um, and some initial results, because really I've only been um, seriously capturing data for about six months, and obviously there's only been sporadic key for some uh, part of that, and because the band isn't open to the same place every day, it takes quite a long time to get uh, repeated data. And then what I'd like to do next. So... Whether we like it or not, most of the antennas that we use uh, transmit one in a particular polarization, whatever that is. Mostly they are linear, sometimes called plane um, polarization, and it's the electric field. Now that's just the definition. It's a convention. That's what it is. And of course, it makes sense because the, the, the electrons are sort of doing this along the elements of your um, antenna. Um, and since at least the 40s, if not the 30s and earlier, at the higher frequencies, horizontal polarization has been, uh, horizontal polarization has been the standard for DX working when you've got a beam. And that's partly, I think, just simply a practical consideration that if you've got a vertical mast made of metal, you can't afford to have that mast in the plane of the antenna. And you, we'll come back to that. Well, I won't actually, but yeah. If you're playing EME or something, absolutely, yeah. Um, and people talk about cross-polarization being large, and if you're running a vertical, you can't, you know, or you're obviously at a disadvantage if you're using a vertical antenna and the incoming signal is, is horizontal. But people talk about 30 dB. I haven't seen 30 dB yet. It's not as much as that, usually. Um, so there's a nice pretty picture. Oh, it's got, bloody hell, this is a slow PC. It's cranking very slowly. So uh, linear polarization, that's just a term I prefer, but um, the red one is the E field, the uh, blue one is the magnetic field, and you can see they're varying together as it sort of propagates. 
and there's the wavelength. God, that is slow. Now, this graphic is quite nice, but a oh, sorry, not that one. Yeah, okay. So, what polarization are your sunglasses? Linear. Somebody's waving his hand like that. Absolutely, because they're vertical. And the reason they work is that the light reflected from the ground at sort of specular, you know, sort of specular reflection-ish, or near like a mirror, um, because of something called uh, Brewster angle is partially horizontally polarized, so you're absorbing the horizontal stuff uh, in the, the, the lenses of your sunglasses. So you are actually using polarization measurement techniques even when you're out driving in your car. So there's a nice graphic. Uh, it's going upwards for some reason. I think maybe because they were interested in <laughs> satellite communications or something. Um, so I just wanted to say something about circular polarization or elliptical because it's... Um, it's sometimes, you know, it just because the polarization of your signal coming in is going like that doesn't mean it's circular. It's circular because it's actually intrinsic to the wave. It actually rotates, I called it at the speed of light, and I realize that's sort of an oxymoron. But, uh, you know, something like it's doing it all the time as it goes forward. So what you've got here um, is you've got two planes. Let's say X is horizontal and Y is vertical. You can say it the other way around if you want to. There's, there's your horizontal signal. There's the two together with a phase shift between them. And that's what creates a vertical. You, there are other ways, of, sorry, circular. That's a way, there are other ways of transmitting circular, obviously. But just in terms of what's in your head, um, that's what the wave's doing. And you know, this is like the wavelength of light here. It's the wavelength of the radio waves. Same thing goes for light, obviously. And if the X and Y are different amplitudes, and I, I gather, <laughs> I've been doing some reading, that the convention used for defining left-handed and right-handed circular for light, optical, is different. It's the opposite from the one that's used for uh, radio. God knows why, but it is. And obviously, if they're not the same amplitude, which they generally aren't, um, you end up with something that's elliptical. So I hope that wasn't sort of teaching grandma to suck eggs, but just sort of to set some basic understanding. So I was inspired to start doing this by some stuff uh, that Graham D3TCT there circulated a while ago. Because um, as I say, I think we're, we're blind to a really important characteristic of the of radio waves here. And we, we it, there's, there's something to be gained from finding out about it. So what Graham does, and he can correct me if I get this wrong, um, you've got a, a five element, six meters, that, that's six meters, four meters, in fact. Uh, so there's a horizontal beam and a two element, effectively, vertical beam, yeah? Yeah. Um, so those are the vertical and horizontal components, and they both, uh, he, in this case, he uses a K3. There's a whole load of recordings and stuff I find really interesting on uh, Graham's website. Um, he uses an oscilloscope type program to produce what they call litigious figures, which is um, feeding the horizontal into the horizontal channel, and this one did work when I tried it earlier, uh, and the vertical signal into the vertical ch oh bollocks, <laughs> pardon my French. Oh, stop it! Right now I've got I've got to actually click in the right place. <laughs> right. So that is the Lerwick beacon when it was on. I've just been talking to someone about uh, the prospect of getting it back on, uh, which would be nice. They don't know what frequency to put it on, Murray. That was part of the problem. <laughs> I know. Depends whether it becomes a coordinated beacon or not, because it's actually a thousand kilometers away um, from GB3MCB, which might be the other one. So you can see that, roughly speaking, horizontals this way, verticals that way. It's changing all the time. It's flipping from one to the other. That's quite, that's quite common. That's normal. That is normal. Um, what you can do for DXing purposes, if you, if, if you have dual receivers, which, as I say, um, Graham has two, I have two in a different way. Um, if they're synchronized with each other, if you sync the VFOs, uh, you can put one in each ear, and it actually is quite useful. Because your brain is actually very good at sorting out which one to listen to. It gets a bit more difficult if you try and do it automatically. 
So um, another noddy diagram for you all. Um, but uh, we know that F layer propagation goes higher, bounces further than sporadic E, and that it's, it's, it's refraction, it's not reflection, it's refraction in the ion sphere, so it bends like that. And it travels some distance, quite a long way, into that layer. You might think of an effective height, but the effective height is not where it actually is. W the effective height, in this case, would be up there somewhere, if it was a reflection. Sporadic E is a bit different, and one of the little motivations behind what I'm doing is a sort of, well, how different is it? Because you think of sporadic E as being very relatively thin layers of very intense ionization with the wind shear bringing, you know, increasing the concentration. Well, therefore, how f just how far through the medium is the wave actually going? In other words, is what's coming out the other end still elliptically polarized? Or is it more like reflection from a, from a metal? I don't know. Thought I might find out. Don't know yet, by the way. Well, that's a rather bold statement, John. <laughs> No, no, I s that's an interesting, well, but how do you know that? I'd be interested in the references. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, the ionosphere, th um, there's a thing called birefringence. It happens in the optical world as, as, as well as it does in the ionosphere, except that the, the cause of it is something slightly different. So, I mean, this is optical birefringence, um, and it birefringence means that there are two different uh, refractive indices in two different um, directions. So that this pen, this is a, this is a calcite crystal. Yet another picture I've nicked from somebody's website. This is what they call the ordinary ray, and in calcite, it's it's to do with the linear polarizations. One polarization comes straight through, more or less, and the other one comes out significantly different place. In the ionosphere, it's to do with the interaction between the radio waves and the magnetic field of the of the Earth, whether it's you're traveling along the magnetic field or across it, simplistically. So you get an ordinary ray and an extraordinary ray. Uh, LF or VLF, those two waves can come out in completely different places. You can have an ordinary ray there and an extraordinary ray over there, and never the twain shall meet. At six meters, they're not. They're coming out more or less in the same place. And of course, what's actually happening is that when they come out again and they hit your antenna, they've actually added up into something or other. So the, the combined wave, if you like, is all, almost always, well, that's the theory anyway, almost always elliptical. And if anybody's got any questions, uh, like John disagrees with me, then fine. Please go ahead. There aren't that so many of us that we shouldn't do that. So I just wanted to know, you know, and if, and if, if any of you take one thing away from this, it's actually it's quite interesting to try and find out whatever it is. Good question. Don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I understand that the extraordinary and uh, can be described as left and right. The two of them, one's left, one's right. There you go. Anyway, so what I did was, if you like, it's sort of taking Graham's idea and just sort of uh, going, taking it a bit further. Um, because I'm a six meter DXer, so I don't want to lose the ability to, d uh, to do that. So I'm using an antenna like that, which is quite, quite large. It's not the biggest six meter antenna in the world by any means, but it's also not small, it's 30 foot long. Um, big, uh, so this is a, a 7LE X pole that Justin uh, makes. It's quite heavy, it weighs a bit two, twice as much as your average uh, uh, JHV antenna or something like that. Um, the, the vertical stub, the stub mast is uh, non-metallic, it's fiberglass scaffold pole, which interestingly is actually stronger than alloy scaffold pole in terms of breaking force, but actually it's, it's bendier. So it whips around a little bit more, not, 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 not dramatically. Um, I have to feed it out the back because um, not only does the mast have an effect on the vertical antenna, but actually the feeder would as well. So the best compromise is feed it out behind the reflector. And I've got two 
separate feeders, two feeders all the way back, and they're as identical as I can make them. I mean, fortunately, at six meters, you know, half an inch doesn't actually amount to very many degrees of phase, so, you know, it's not too bad. But it, that's just so I can do what I like with it. And for the ornithologist, uh, that's a swallow. <laughs> um, so I use uh, an Anan 100D Apache. Uh, it's the Indian manufacturer. Uh, similar, but a bit more open source. And uh, um, you're slightly than to the flex radios. Flex radios cost twice as much, though. But also, it, it tends to be more at the sort of leading edge of development, which unfortunately, which is great in that you get new stuff. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a bit quirky. So if you like playing around with, with uh, software and radio, this is <laughs> actually it's great fun. I spend time playing around with it. So this is just, I mean, I just want to show you the example of the screen. You've got two receivers, two nearly identical receive paths. Um, and so that's the horizontal receiver pan adapter across. That's from sort of 50 megs up to 50 point, God, I can't even read it, one f 110 or something. Um, this is the horizontal, sorry, that's the horizontal antenna, this is the vertical antenna. And just for the, for the sake of demonstration, uh, that's GB3BAA, because I'm in, uh, on the Hampshire, bo Surrey border, so um, I've got two strong local beacons, plus I can hear MCB as well. But uh, that's GB3BAA there and there. GB3BAA has a vertical antenna. That's GB3RAL. And... RAL has a horizontal antenna, so you can see the difference, although it's not 30 dBs. It's not 30 dBs. And that's, um, that's some, some bloke on SSB. I, it was in, I, can't, I think I did that. There wasn't, the band wasn't open at the time, so that's some sort of G station. But even then, look, it's not zero on vertical. Although you do have to be careful, because off the side, uh, a horizontal antenna, effectively, if you imagine the wave going, if you look from that way, it's vertical, actually. Off the side, a horizontal dipole actually is emitting vertical polarization. Interesting. Not that it matters much, but it does. Right, okay, so the other really neat thing that the Anan software, or the um, open uh, software that runs the Anan has, is what's called a radio astronomy data collection. Um, so that's the purpose it was originally designed for, but I've been using that just to capture. This is just signal strength. I can't capture the phase at the moment in this, but it should be possible because the software doesn't do it. Maybe. The, the point is, though, that, um, that one, of the thing, one of the things the Anand does is, is actu it can actu actually provides you with diversity reception in the sense of being able to cancel out noise. That's quite, I'm not going to talk about that today, but you can actually uh, take the horizontal and vertical and, and use them to reduce your noise level. But so, Horizontal signal from GB3 RAL at my uh, my QTH, which and it's a very obstructed path. There are about three three hills in the way. Um, so, and this is the vertical polarization. You can see the the difference between them is only about 12 dB on this particular day. It varies on this particular day, and these blips here are the CW keying part of the. Uh, beacon cycle. Obviously when it's a uh, constant carrier or when it's on digital, it's uh, provided you set the web bandwidth wide enough, it's constant. Um, two things to note. Firstly, see, the, see the, the extra noise on the vertical signal. Now that, that's not noise because the noise level in the bandwidth that I was using here would be about here. About 130. Minus 130. This is in uh, dB relative to a microvolt, a uh, millivolt. Uh, milliwatt, dB relative to a milliwatt, which is one of the other nice things about SDRs. You can actually get a calibrated signal out of it. You actually know what you're measuring. I mean, obviously, it's all dependent on losses and antennas and all that stuff. But nonetheless, it's if it says if a difference is 10 dB, you can be fairly sure it's close to 10 dB. So there's a lot more scattery type noise on it, and I think that's genuine, by the way, uh, in that this on that particular day the signal was being scattered somehow. Secondly, you can see various features like that. Beautiful thing. Took me five minutes to sort of think, well, what the bloody hell is that? It's aircraft scatter. Because the path between me and RAL goes quite close to Heathrow. Um, and it does a sort of classic thing of 
it's just like what you hear, you know, if, you, if you're particularly on the higher bands, uh, the sort of pattern you get. Uh, I haven't actually got a blow up of that, but you know, it, it's actually remarkably symmetrical. The other thing interesting thing is that it do, uh, this one, for instance, there's something on both traces here, both traces there, both traces here. That one, it doesn't appear on the lower trace. So it must just have been at the right angle so that the, ver the reflection of the vertical component was, well, nulled out to less than, you know, less than that. Uh, and the other thing it told me is that the difference between my two antennas was relatively small as well. The, the leakage, so I say, be, be correct about it, the leakage was relatively small. In other words, uh, if you'd, if part of this signal was actually the, the horizontally polarized signal leaking through, my vertical antenna being sensitive to the horizontal component, you'd, you'd see that, that effect on that trace as well, and you don't on this particular one. Sometimes, most of the time you do, obviously, it's, this is just luck, happen to, happen to hit that. So that's all very useful. Uh, the other thing that this uh, bit of software does is allows you to download the data into a spreadsheet uh, and then do stuff, do stuff with it. Sorry, I've, I've got, forgotten my watch, so I need my phone to tell me what time it is. Um, and mo the, the, ch the things I'm going to show you uh, slightly later are actually data that's been taken down to a spreadsheet and then processed. At this stage, as I say, it's pretty late. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, this doesn't work. What I should have done, uh, it doesn't work on this PC, it works on mine. Um, the audio is embedded in a, the PowerPoint presentation, um, but obviously I used the wrong format, so this doesn't work. So this was actually pretty early. This is like uh, 18 months ago now. And I was listening to Peter JBCG, who's always very loud. Uh, he was via Aurora. You've got an S9 Aurora signal. And I was at that point, I didn't have the Allen, so I was just switching between the two polarizations. Um, and when you switch from the horizontal to the vertical, it almost disappears. Not quite. You can just about hear it in the background. Uh, and in fact, you can hear the tropo signal. It's such a shame I can't show you that. But anyway, it, and, and it's not, I mean, it's anecdotal. It's only, ha I've only got one recording of it. Generally, it does appear. And according to the literature, there is some, uh, it's, it's about 50 years old, but there's some research that shows that most auroral signals actually arrive back the same polarization as they left. Um, and that was certainly the case here. If anything, in my experience, my limited experience so far, uh, auroral signals are more horizontally polarized than most tropo signals. Interesting. Curiosity, if you like. Okay, so there's a, there's a real chart of a real signal. Um, it's, it's an SSB signal. And the first thing I'd point out is that that's the noise level. And you can see that the noise level is higher. And this is just, if you like, this is for real operators now, if you really want to do this. One of the things I've found, I don't know whether you'd agree with this one, John, is that the noise level on vertical polarization, the background noise level, is higher than it is on horizontal. I'm not talking about man, well, not talking about man easily identify, you know, your ADSL signals or the, the, the plasma TVs or whatever it is, that's different. But the general mush is anywhere from, well, there I think I've got one direction where they're the other way around, but uh, where the, ho the horizontal is stronger than the vertical, but virtually every direction, there's a few dB, and you can see on this case it was, I don't know, about three or four. Um, and by the way, I wondered whether that was real. So I rotated the whole antenna around its boom, and it stayed that way. It stayed that way. In other words, it's the, 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 no the extra noise was still vertical, so it's not the antenna, it's not the feeder, it's not the receiver, it's real. Oh, uh, sometimes it's worse than that. Interesting question. Yeah. Well, that's a different effect, though. This is noise. Whatever. So, um, 
Interesting point then, so the horizontal signal, as I say, this is SSB, so there's lots of gaps in it. Interestingly, uh, it was pretty heavily processed SSB, ISCOBSI. If you've been on six meters this summer, you will have heard him. He tends to call CQ for long periods of time and he's very loud. Um, so uh, in on the official definition of S9 at 30 megs and above, S9 is actually here, minus 93 on HF, it will be up there. But uh, above 30 megs, it's there. Uh, so this is a really strong signal. So noise effects are <laughs> way down. Um, if you were listening on your horizontal antenna, that's the black, he would disappear right there, virtually, and then come back up. Whereas the vertical signal is staying much more, um, con in this particular example, more constant. And, and I've got a series of uh, sort of indicative results here, which I'm not claiming are definitive in any way, but they're not, you know, I haven't sifted through hours and hours and hours to find these really interesting things. It, this is pretty much what came up. Um, so I can't say that it's always going to be the case. But this guy was definitely transmitting horizontally polarized because I asked him, um, and the signal disappeared. Um, one of the things I've done then in the spreadsheet is to convert the dBm to microvolts and then work out what the effective angle is. Now, this is begging the question of whether it's linear, polarized, or um, circular, or el elliptical, or whatever. But you know, if you were looking with a real aerial, or two real aerials, it, it tells you sort of what you'd see. And the polarization does that. In this particular trace, the polarization does that. So you've got something that's varying over a period. Well, I've got some others which vary more quickly. But you know, it's not chaotic. The um, it's what I've just called a polarization angle, because you can't tell which quadrant it's in from the amplitudes. So zero degrees, that's horizontal, and that's vertical. Sorry, it's probably not legible. Actually. It does actually say it up there, but <laughs> you probably can't read it from there. Uh, yeah, so, so a signal down here is nearly horizontally polarized. A signal up there is nearly pure vertical, according to this uh, measurement. Interesting, you've got multiple sort of cycles and over quite long periods. Um, so SSB signals aren't the greatest thing to, to monitor because obviously they're very intermittent. Actually, CW is not great either because that's actually even more intermittent. Um, so I've uh, most of the, 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 the data that I want to take forward is actually coming from FSK or digital beacons because they're transmitting, as long as you, as I say, as long as you get the bandwidth right, they, they're tra transmitting a constant signal. Um, so that's HG7BVA, um, vertical antenna. That bit there, I, uh, I, I, I think I just flipped the frequency if I remember rightly, but anyway, that was just to see what the noise level was. So noise level is down there. Uh, as I say, it's a vertically polarized antenna on the beacon. Not surprisingly, the red trace is stronger than the, than the black trace. And that is the pattern that corresponds, the polarization pattern that corresponds to it. Um, I'm not going to swear that that bias to the vertical is totally genuine. I don't know. I need to sort of do some more calibration. But there's pretty damn sure a, a some sort of oscillation in there, isn't there? And you could say it's probably rotating. Sorry? No. Well, what I can do is a power spectrum, actually, on the rate that it changes. And I, that's one of my little things to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure what it would tell us, but it would be interesting. Because on this particular case, you've got a single frequency, if you like, of rotation here, pretty much-ish. You know, it's going yang, 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 like that. Interesting. So it's real. You know, it does happen. And... Um, that's not an unusual trace. It happens to be a, it's a relatively clean one. So, you know. I'm sorry. The transmitter on that one is vertical. Yeah. That's the thing about be people think that for a beacon, you know, an omnidirectional, so let's make it vertical. Uh, yeah, most of the time that's okay. But actually, vertically polarized signals do tend to arrive more vertical than horizontal and the other way around. So actually, if you're putting a beacon on, it does make sense to make it horizontal if you want to be 
uh, not only from the tropo point of view, obviously, but even on uh, sporadic E. So this is like single hop sporadic E. Uh, here's another bit of single hop, uh, IE0JX, also a vertical antenna. Um, what this time, I've, sorry, that previous one was over a period of three or four minutes. Okay. This one, I've actually blown up the middle bit, so this is 20 seconds here. And, well, it's not chaotic, is it? It's definitely, it has a clearly defined whether it's elliptical or whatever, it's a clearly defined direction and it changes in a pretty smooth way. Now, you wouldn't expect it to change completely. You know, if that had been a sine wave, I'd have been extremely surprised because clearly when it's going, whatever it's doing as it travels through the ionosphere, the E layer, um, it's, it's not homogeneous. If it goes up, then the angle of the, it, you know, if it's doing that, then the angle relative to the magnetic field is changing. Uh, the, the movement of the electrons in the ionosphere is changing the magnetic field to a degree. All sorts of things are contributing. You've got multiple reflection points, whatever the hell. So you wouldn't expect it to be a nice smooth curve. Actually, that was, that's a lot smoother than I thought. That's, that's more smooth than I expected. But interesting all the same. Uh, so that was that one. Uh, what do I do next? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just in case you get the idea, uh, this, is relatively, th this is the only trace I've got that does this. Um, so it's relatively unusual, but just in case you think it's doing this all the time, this is uh, another FSK beacon, S55ZRS, uh, and you can see, well in this case it was a strong, so uh, S9 as I say is about here, uh, so you've got a 5789 sort of signal, which suddenly goes, drops down, and gets quite low actually here, and the, and the noise level in that bandwidth, I've not actually recorded what bandwidth I did it in, but something fairly narrow. Uh, I always use a bandwidth that's the, the minimum that will capture both tones on the FSK. Um, it will be, be around here somewhere. It'll be five or 600 hertz, this bandwidth. Um, looks pretty noisy down there, but. So, so in this particular case, I don't know what was going on. I mean, there are some times when you get a consistent Every single from a particular area has a particular kind of skew on it. So there's something systematic going on. And something systematic was clearly happening here, and that's the polarization calculation. The interesting thing is even the noisy bit still seems to do that. Interesting, isn't it? Um, so I, it's quite, I, you know, I would guess that it might well have been roughly circular here. So it appeared, if, if circular would look like equal horizontal and vertical. But it's obviously something's changed. It's gone boing and then back towards reversion to the mean or something. So just in case you get too carried away, <laughs> funny things happen too. Um, I also wanted to see whether it uh, happens on multi-hop. Uh, unfortunately, the only two multi-hop beacons I've managed to record this year are both CW beacons. They're not FSK. Uh, so D4C, double hop. Uh, and you can see where the carrier drops off. This is a horizontal antenna, it's a beam pointing at Europe, uh, and mm, you can sort of see that the black is sort of stronger than the, but it, and also, by the way, of it's a weaker signal. So bear in mind, we've got the noise there. And the, but it still does it, yeah? It still does it in a slightly more chaotic way. And I, I think actually, if I looked at this, uh, more closely, it might well do. I mean, that I0JX recording actually was a, was, a, was a chaotic bit in the middle of my longer trace, and I just sort of expand it out. And actually, it's doing something quite nice, and very likely that's doing the same thing. That's an interesting point, actually. So you've got a, you've got a beat between the two traces. Ah. Um, so there you go, that's probably triple hop-ish, might have been four, I don't know, um, WZ8D, um, oh, pff, lots of QSP, um, again, not a particularly strong signal, and it's still doing it. So you've still got this systematic variation in the polarization, however you characterize it, and um, I mean, you might, s the fact that these, this one, doesn't go all the way to either horizontal or vertical, might just mean that it's 
it's elliptical, so it never is pure horizontal or vertical. Right, some tentative, I have to say it's tentative because I, you know, you can't be sure on a limited set of data. So it's certainly not uncommon for a horizontally, and I've, I've asked more than once, I've asked people on the KST chart, are you actually using a horizontal or a vertical? And they've always said horizontal. Uh, but it comes back vertical for long periods. And it works the other way as well. You know, a vertical beacon or something can come through horizontal. Um, it, you've, I've already said that it, it's constantly changing. The effective, my definition of effective polarization. Um, and it seconds to minutes. It doesn't, it, oh, I, what I didn't say was actually that that data logging software um, it has the ability to average signals, but I didn't want to do that. So I'm running it at maximum speed, if you like. So um, it's recording roughly every 60 milliseconds, and it's, it, it takes about 10 milliseconds to make one capture. Uh, and I don't actually know whether it does the two receivers in parallel or one after the other. I don't know. Um, so... It's constantly changing, but if it was changing on a tenth of a second sort of time scale, I've got 16, you know, I, it, I'd be able to see it, and it isn't. So there's a sort of lower limit there somewhere, and obviously, you know, it's as long as you like in, in the long term. Um, but, as I said before, if it started out horizontal, it's probably, it's some, somewhat more likely to be horizontal, but not that much. Auroral singles do, in my experience, uh, retain their original polarization. Tropo if I actually did an experiment with a local repeater. I thought, let me test the vertical thing. And it was coming out 45 degrees. Then, it d then I discovered that actually the antenna's on the other side of their tower. So it's going around. But Tropo is very rarely pure horizontal. And in my QTH now, this doesn't necessarily apply to you, although it sounds like it does to John. Um, the background noise is usually several dB higher on vertical than on horizontal. But note, I didn't, and I haven't got a picture for this, but it's quite distinctive. Um, the sort of spikes you can see on the pan adapter from uh, a TV or an ADSL line or whatever it is are normally stronger on the horizontal. And that sort of makes sense because around me um, there are um, power lines. That our power lines are um, elevated. Our phone lines are elevated. So the, if you were in a, a, a place where, the, where those things are buried, maybe you wouldn't see that. I don't know. So all I can say is that's what I've seen. And in terms of doing stuff... Next, I would like to be able to turn this thing into a true polarimeter so I can see uh, the difference between elliptical and linear. Um, power spectrum, funnily enough, <laughs> that uh, you mentioned there. Obviously, I need more data because it's very, it's anecdotal now. Uh, more tar f a limited number of targets and clever ways of dealing with lots of data. So when you're... When a sig next time a signal disappears on sporadic E, it might be because it's gone, or it might just be the polarization's rotated, or it could be the cat. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Can I make two comments first? Um, and I don't want to usurp your lecture. <laughs> um, my forte is two meter moon bounce, and what I showed in my last talk, which was why I did all sorts of other things, was actually I have full polarization diversity on 144 now. Two channels coming through, and I actually use LINRAD, and LINRAD mm -hmm. gives me the polarization out of the dual channel SDR. Mm. So I actually have the phase information. I did this for EME, mm. but I can tell you I ran it in the Persids meteor shower, and it is absolutely stunning because mm. you see the ellipsoids going blah, like that during a meteor burst, mm. which is very similar for ionospheric propagation. The second part is oh, to feed the discussion. I threw a random comment in that all sporadic E is chordal, mm. and you actually, well, you actually said so. The sporadic E is not reflection. It is not like a metal sure. reflection. You have an E layer that's curved like that, and you have a continuously refracted signal within a given length of the E layer before it comes back down like that. Refract so are you saying that that, that penetrates as deeply as it would for F2? Well, I forget what that is. 
that you actually have a path length within the E layer, and that path length is subject to Faraday sure. rotation, and the stuff on Faraday rotation was done to death for EME, which is my background, obviously. So you, I believe that what you're seeing via your time and phase changes is a variation of the height, the width, and the length in the E layer because of the changing uh, electron density in that during propagation. And I don't want to run the lecture anymore, but I thought, I thought that that was probably mm. worth doing because that is the experience from the EME world, even on six meters. And actually, terrestrial propagation has got the same problem, I believe. And I think what you're, t and of course, where you have two hops, you've got that combined twice, so you've got the variability twice. Absolutely. And when you get to six hops, you've got chaos theory coming in. So actually, whether it's elliptical or whatever, depends on the path length there, the electron density, and the direction of the two components with the magnetic field. I'd and still like to see the, the experimental evidence. And there are a number of papers and things on the internet relating to EME and the path length at six meters in the ionosphere. So, sorry, that bit. Any <laughs> questions for Chris? <laughs> and you've got five minutes. Um, hi. You, hi, you know the cross the Argies, are they yeah. so they can receive both horizontal and vertical? Correct. So if you were res receiving a horizontal signal, yeah. would the, the lesser signal on the vertical part of the Argy be added to the, the horizontal? How would it work? Well, the two... Um, Antenna, or if you were using that antenna for uh, EME or uh, particularly satellites, you would feed them both together on a single feeder and you would put a phasing line in to put one a quarter of a wave out from the other. Remember that picture of the, you put the two waves are out by a quarter of a wavelength. Um, and then it would be a single sort of single receiver, so both are going into the same bit of feeder. In my case, I've got two feeders, so they're like, they're not, they can't be completely separate because they're on the same boom. But um, they are complete. They're separately fed identical feeders all the way down to the bottom. So the signal I've got on receiver one is purely horizontal, and the signal I've got on receiver two is purely vertical. And I combine them in the receive in the software. Um, that's an interesting question. No. In a nutshell, it, it although if obviously if it was a po if it was uh, you know if you're talking about a circular signal or a slant signal, I mean, but it's, it's not in a systematic way. It's not like stacking. Uh, it would increase his overall timeliness of signals if he digitally processed Yeah, the average will be higher. If, if yeah. he digitally yeah. processed them yeah. to receive the complex between the two polarizations, which is actually how all the work on EME works, and it's dawning on me this, uh, this morning, actually having played it on Meteor Scatter to apply that on six mm, meters, to actually run an X polar ray with separate feeders would probably give you an advantage on receive over some others. Yeah. Jim. Thank you. Um, well, this is really interesting stuff, I have to mm. say. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent insight into areas where we need to be looking. And um, uh, it's following up on John's comment about his diagram of the E layer. Mm. Uh, I, I, th I think I think actually the feeling I have, and from the literature that I've read, th the implication is that it's not really good enough to just see it as a as a layer like mm. that for an ease patch, and it is probably an undulating wave mm. type string which is actually propagating through a zone. It's almost as if you shine a torch on the ceiling and you get an ellipse, and that sort of area contains within it a moving mm. wave train of ease. And the pattern that you're getting could well have some uh, reflection, not reflection, but some yeah. some So it could uh, be blowing past that, or something like that. The wavelength it? of that yeah. little wave yeah. train within the ease patch. Exactly. And it would be int but, but then that raises another question, because on your multi-hop paths, you would think that you might well lose that consistency that you get with a single hop because mm. the, the likelihood because you've got two that they'll all ones, be yeah. in step. Yeah. And, and, and the more hops you have, the more confused that pattern yeah, should be. Yeah, so yeah. you'd expect the correlation to And it is, but not probably. as much as you think. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Good. Mm. Right, the basic maths for doing the Faraday rotation and that 
is in a book by Lucien Bouthias that was published in 1978 called Radio Wave Propagation. Further questions? Oh, well, Just thank you me. very, very, very much, Chris. I've actually learned something today that actually I should be able to take my two meter moon bounce techniques to six meter terrestrial DXing. And really fascinating. I quite really like the idea of the uh, the cat at the end um, works quite well so thank you very much Chris enlightening talk and let's thank Chris in the usual way <laughs>